Wherever you are in the world, you are listening to Social Solutions on Revolution Radio. Today is Friday, May 8th. I'm broadcasting out of Dallas, Texas, and I have a guest here today, a recurring guest and VIP guest, Michael Volpe, an independent investigative researcher and reporter who has got breaking news, status update on what I like to call CPS family court shenanigans. Um, before I invite him on, I just want to ask and remind everyone, we are 100% listener supported, and if you could, please go to freedomslips.com, donate, there's a button at the top, or you can uh, shop at the store, uh, which is top left-hand corner, or send a check, go to the near bottom, and get the information for making your check out to and mailing it to um, Revolution Radio. And without further ado, because I want to make sure that we get as much time with uh, Michael as we can, because he's just a wealth of information. He's a fabulous advocate and blogger and has created and prompted so much change uh, for the better and illuminates so many uh unfair injustices that are going on with whistleblowers and parents uh, whose children are uh, used as pawns and some kind of political, sometimes like power game that's going on. So without further ado, Michael, welcome back. Thank God it's Friday. Uh, What do you have for us today? If you can hear me. Michael's Michael's muted. Hey, my bad. I was muted. All right. Okay. Do you hear me? Okay. I do that too. I do that okay. too. Okay, uh, yeah, no I'm, I'm doing okay. I'm a little bit coroned out, but <laughs> all right, everybody is. I wanted to first of all say I definitely haven't eliminated it, uh, all of this corruption, but I I I do my best. Uh, so I had a show that I was going to do with you. It'll be roughly the same show, however. Uh, In the last couple of days, some things have happened that I needed to update you about because the last time I was on, we also had a woman named Jessica Hartker on. Is that correct? you remember her? Yes, I do. She's very pleasant, and I had some follow-up conversation with her. She was very grateful and appreciative, Um, and she did a really great job with reviewing all the details and recounting the dates and and everything. Very Uh, legit. Do you want to guess where she is now? Oh, my God. I'm almost afraid to ask. Uh, it wouldn't be another, like, I, what was she arrested, like, seven times? Eight, seven times. She's now been arrested again, but 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 not even. All of this happened in Minnesota, specifically Dakota County, Minnesota, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. Yes. And, and uh, a, a hub for a lot of shady stuff, I, I have to say. <laughs> right. Okay. So, hold, oh, so hold on one second. So, um... So, um, so in any case, not only is she in jail, uh, but she's not even in jail in Dakota County. She's in jail in Kent County, Michigan. And the whole thing is very sketchy. Uh, I believe it happened on May 4. So this Monday in sometime in the evening. And I've had several conversations with her since she's been in jail. Other, her friends have had some conversations with her since she's been in jail. And one thing no one can figure out exactly is what is the deal? What has she been detained for? So they are saying that she violated some sort of condition. She, oh, and, and we should note, she had been first charged with some sort of, oh, it was, it's called harassment and stalking her ex, supposedly, even though they live nowhere near each other. So somehow they got, they, Dakota County, that is, charged her with stalking and harassing her ex. And since then, they had one hearing, one hearing. We're into May of 2020. You've got to write this CD trial. But apparently not in Dakota County, Minnesota. That's correct. So she gets arrested again, supposedly for violating the terms of her bail. However, no one can be sure exactly what she did. She's been told multiple stories. And the fact that she's been told multiple stories, uh, or, or maybe not multiple stories, but she still is not sure what she did to violate the terms to cause her in jail. Uh, now, because so, she's in Michigan, because, hold on, let me finish this and then you'll ask your question. Because she's in Michigan and this happens in Minnesota, she has to be extradited 
That oh, also happened. God. That happened to Sandra Grazzini Rucky. So she is. She believes she may have both. <laughs> in fact, I haven't heard from her this morning. She may have already been picked up. She believes it was going to happen sometime today. Um, but uh, Sandra Grazzini Rucky, remember, was extradited from Florida to Minnesota. And during that time, they had her shackled and handcuffed and thrown into a cage. She was in a prison van, not even a bus. She was with the worst of the worst, including a guy from the Aryan Brotherhood. She told me she remembers. And, and they took other, their time too, didn't they? They took, back their, to- they took their time. The the actual driving time from Kent County, Minnesota, Grand, that's Grand Rapids, to Minneapolis is approximately nine hours. So if they take her and it takes 30 hours, 40 hours, 50 hours, you know there's some corruption there. If it takes 15 to 20 hours, that's not necessarily corruption. But you had something you wanted to point out. I'm done now. Um, so I'm assuming there's paperwork that says harassing yeah. and violating terms, the, well, but right. it doesn't specify. So again, we were, here's another, here's another constant. I'm not sure if she saw the, the paperwork. There is paperwork on the original, the actual case. And, right. and so in that it's called a registrar of actions. So the, the docket in that docket, it says that a warrant was issued, and I will tell you the judge who issued the warrant. His name is Robert, and I believe it's A-U-W, or A-W-S, A-W-S-U-M-B, like boy at the end, Robert Awesome. He issued the warrant. I I reached out to him. I reached out to a bunch of people, and... um, if you got time, what I actually wanted to do was uh, read the emails like into the record, if you would. Definitely. Uh, I just wanted to make one point that, uh-huh. that one of the regular continuing points that I find in all of these cases you have is that they don't detail and conceptualize. They have vague terms and they and this is both with whistleblower cases and CPS, you know, court shenanigan cases, they don't actually itemize details of well, what what were the specific dates of harassment? What were this like? You know what I'm saying? So it's like right. very broad. Like you Correct. were harassing, Nebulous. you violated a term, but you're not actually delineating what what was the behavior, what was mm-hmm. the date of the behavior, is there any proof of this behavior? And so it's really the, mm-hmm. using this broad, uh, all encompassing language is a real abuse of power and is a a real it, I would say huge contribution to the fraud. But that said. All right. So what I wanted to say is nebulous. Look up that term if you don't know what it means. Yes, you know, I know nebulous. Wait, hold on. When something something in a situation like this happens, family court, criminal court, whistleblower cases, and it becomes nebulous nine times out of ten, that's because it's covering up for some sort of corruption. So I I wanted to – so I I, I wrote this email. Let me – I – I, I can't see everyone who was on it, but it was uh, Ann Offerman, who is the judge on Jessica's uh, family court uh, custody case. It, Anthony Matthew Anthony, I think, is his name. Uh, um, Anthony Matthew, Matthew Anthony. He is the uh, the clerk for Judge Robert Awesome. Uh, Jeff Shorba, He's like the the head of the administrative part of the court. All of these judges being put on all of these cases, he's actually ultimately responsible. That's how he's responsible for this. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Anthony Anthony Smith, I think, is the, the guy's name, uh, who is the uh, – Anthony Martin. I'm sorry. Oh, my God. I can't believe I don't remember his name. Anthony Martin is the uh, clerk for Robert Awesome, and Matthew Clemenson is the co- clerk for Ann Offerman. And they're both in on it because uh, all all of this evidence has been given to them, and they are they're basically backing their judge. But this is and uh, and so the other people who I who I wrote to were Alyssa Seems Roberson, Lisa Fien, Kyle uh, Christopherson, and Bo Berenson, who were in uh, who are like the press people for the courts. Uh, Cody Myers, that's Jessica's ex. 
the attorney general's office, the FBI and the attorney, uh, his name is James Backstrom, his office, that's the prosecutor in Dakota County. So they all received this email and a couple of other people. So according to the docket I've attached, Judge Offerman filed an order to change custody, I believe, from Jessica Hartker to Cody Myers on May 5, 2020, the day after she was detained by Kent County sheriffs. She was detained by Kent County, Kent County, that's Kent County, Michigan, in the evening May 4, 2020. The warrant for her arrest is sketchy. She tells me she was told it was for failure to appear, except there's no court date for which she could have failed to appear, which is correct. They 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 initially scheduled a court hearing and then canceled it um, uh, sometime in April. It might be that she was supposed to pick up some documents, but she just told me that she already had a warrant for that. This is her eighth arrest since August. I don't think this is any coincidence. I yeah, believe- and talk about her. Hey, come on, Karen, let me finish the email. I believe all of you are participating in a scheme, which is technically illegal, except all the law enforcement. James Backstrom, whose name I accidentally misspelled. Keith Ellison and the FBI refused to do anything thus far, which is why I put him on the email. What do you say? Why was there a warrant for her issue, for her arrest issue? Why is this the second time when an order has been issued in her case, ex parte in her custody? How do we go from Cody falling unconscious and overdosing while his young son was locked inside his place in July 2018 to him having sole custody while Jessica has been arrested eight times? Why does this pattern seem so familiar to the Rucky case, the Rice case? That's Caroline Rice and her daughter, Annalise. Kim Sperling, who you'll hopefully have on sometime soon. And Leah Danowitz and others. This looks like racketeering. Where am I going wrong? Now, I, some people responded, which I want to get to, but you wanted to make a point first. I was just saying that it's interesting that they're basically harassing her. And yet they're accusing her of harassment. I, I, there's a deep seated irony there. Right. Okay. I, I agree. Uh, that's because uh, that's probably called projection. People like that project a lot. So the first person to respond is Cody Myers, her ex, M Y E R S. I explicitly told you not to contact me, he said. I will repeat that for you. Do not contact me again. It's a pretty strong words. Wow, he's a little, he's a little, yeah, I mean, why are you so excited? (laughs) Are you, are you a little nervous about, are you, you, uh, maybe we should end the broadcast. That was pretty tough, right? (laughs) Okay. So this is my response. Um, And this is all happens on the 6th of May. Uh, 1.38 PM was my response. I can't see all the numbers, but I just accused you of participating in an organized crime scheme. You don't get to say that to me. And I have to reach out to you because before I accuse you of it publicly, as I'm doing right now, I have to give you the opportunity, and I forgot to say to respond, uh, your response to being accused of being a part of an organized crime scheme is to threaten me. I don't need to tell you how that will look when I repeat it, as I just did. (laughs) All right, so... Uh, then I, I realized I should have sent the first email to a couple of different people. And one of them was Sarah Fitzgerald, who was like the department of corrections sp- spokesperson. And, um, the reason I sent it to corrections is because I'm, I, I, I am a little concerned about exactly what will happen to Jessica Harker, Harker when she is transferred. And, and right now, so I want all of them to know that she better be safe. So I hadn't, uh, in fact, Sarah Fitzgerald, this woman, hadn't responded to my emails in a long time. And I haven't sent her an email in a while. However, I've sent her over 100 over a couple of years because I looked it up. Uh, So this is her response. Nicholas Kimball has replaced me at the Department of Corrections. He can be rich, and she gave me his email. Isn't that, isn't that, uh, she's very helpful, am I correct? (laughs) All right. All right. So now let me, but I, I, I wanted to give her a response, even though she was helpful. Here's my response. You ready? I'll reach out to him, but you were intimately involved in the Rocky case. I'm saying this is a racketeering conspiracy, all connected. You were involved in making sure Sandra Gorzini Rocky was placed in a jail rather than a prison. She was beaten one night, having her nose broken and her attacker was never even investigated while she was in your custody. 
you did not get her proper medical treatment after she broke her nose. Instead, Timothy Gonder forced uh, Sandra Grazzini Rucky to be chi- chained to the bed while she got while she got medical treatment and wouldn't leave the room when she was checked out, including stripping, and took photos of her while she was in a compromising position. All of this you knew and did nothing. You're a part of this. And when I break this, and I misspelled break, I don't know why, uh, I'll hold you appropriately accountable. Until then, I'll contact your colleague. So now I sent an email to her colleague. Okay, so this is Nicholas Kimball. Are you excited? I am. I, I love right. the way you just go for this. Yeah. Okay. I reached out to Sarah Fitzgerald, and she told me to reach out to you. There was a woman who will be arriving in your jail system in Minnesota in a few days. She's arriving then because she's being extradited from Michigan. Her name is Jessica Hartger, and I'm attaching her booking sheet from Kent County Jail. I believe her life is in danger. I believe that because I believe she's the victim of a complicated scheme which is described below, and then below this email, the original email I read is there, okay? Forced, uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, described below. I, w- I believe the courts have tag team with the co- cops and jail to try and destroy mi- women like Ms. Hartger. Another example is Sandra Grazzini Rucky, who was beaten in jail, forced to be cocked at by a, and I forgot to say by, by a Dakota County Sheriff's Office officer who was on duty named Timothy Gonder. Timothy G- Gonder not only forced her to be handcuffed while she was being treated after she broke her nose, but he wouldn't leave the room even when the examination required her to strip. He also took a photo of her in a compromising position. And I should have mentioned this earlier, but I've attached him to the email to confirm, and Timothy Gonder is on this email. I totally forgot. You've been forewarned in case anything happens to her, and if anything isn't done by the book toward her, I will report everywhere I can. Wow. How was that? I just said, wow. Okay, so that is uh, that is the update on her case. And folks, if you don't know Jessica's case in detail, she was on previously with me, so you probably want to uh, find uh, the, um, the old show. And yes, and I just posted your blog uh, for our tatters. If you want to be part of the live discussion, come on down to freedomslips.com. We have a chat room going in here. Looks like we've got some trolls or something going on this morning. Uh, so we do have moderators, and so good digital behavior is expected. Uh, however, I did uh, uh, put the, the provocateur.blogspot.com. Uh, for people to follow all of your work, and then I will further uh, add the the video from our last okay. meeting. So uh, to keep going, uh, Jessica Hartker, her case happened out of Lakeville, Minnesota, which is in Dakota County. And I've just given you the update. Sandra Grazzini Rucky was out of uh, Lakeville, Minnesota, Dakota County. Uh, they shared some of the same judges. They shared some of the same cops. Uh, one cop is Kelly Coughlin, who is a detective with Lakeville, Minnesota Police. There is a third case, and hopefully soon you will have this woman on your show. Her name is Kim Sperling, and all of her stuff happened quite a, a relatively long period ago, about 10 years. But she and I believe that what was happening was Dakota County and the state of Minnesota and Lakeville itself, because her case happened out of Lakeville, Minnesota. You, you'd be shocked to learn that Kelly Coughlin is involved in her case as well. That's K-E-L-L-I uh, space Coughlin, K-O-U-G-H-L-I-N. Um, but in Kim Sperling's case, she wound up fleeing to Canada and applying for refugee status. And I just want to read you the definition of someone who believes they're a refugee. A person who has been forced to leave their country in order to escape war, persecution, or natural disaster. Now, wow. tell me, Ten years ago, did we have a war uh, in, inside the borders of the United States that would warrant someone to believe they'd have to be a refugee to escape the war? Did we have one of those ten years ago? I mean, I I I would think so. Yes, but right. Well, we didn't. I mean, no, it's, no, up, it's not, all up to interpretation on how you define no, 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 war. No, but there were no there were no bombs. there were no wars. Right? No, yeah, there, there was, was no, no like official war. Yeah. Right. No, no, but there were no bombs being dropped on us. Right. There was no war. All right. Military wasn't 
roaming the streets, shooting each other. There was no war. So she's not escaping war. Was there a natural disaster that just destroyed the continent to the point where everyone had to escape? Do we have one of those? We, we have a lot no. of hurricanes. Or, right. So it's not one yeah. of those. And so it's persecution. All right. This woman applied for refugee status because she was being persecuted. So her case follows the same pattern as the Rucky case and the Hartger case. So as soon as she found or people found uh, evidence of abuse by her ex-husband. Let me give you a couple. So, uh, wait, was she, was she granted? Was she granted the? She wasn't ever granted it. However, they let her stay to argue it for so long that by the time every that at some point her daughter was over eighteen and she could just go back to the United States. So they wow. did, they never they never granted it. But they also, even though they kept denying it, didn't final deny it. So that it was. Basically, it, it got tied up in court for three years, which will tell you something about the refugee system. Uh, however, she did uh, apply for a protective order and had it reapproved or whatever it's called four different times. And each of the five court hearings, she was in front of a different judge and she presented not, not the exact same evidence, but roughly the same evidence that she presented to a court in Minnesota. And that court was uh, being overseen primarily by one judge, Tim Wormager of all of this abuse, and, and I want to go over just a little bit of it after explaining the story. So all five of those judges in Canada heard it, and they granted her the protective order, and they reauthorized it and reauthorized it all four times. So I think it, for like three and a half years or four years, because the first time was an emergency, then the second time was like three, four weeks later, then it was like a year, another year, another year, uh, until you reached the full five, so however many that was. Um, so in any case... Um, that's basically that that was the process. But so in one case, her I think one of one of her son's friends told his mom this. And then that, that son's friend's mom put this into an affidavit that Kim's ex would insist that that the two boys, the two friends would shower together and in front of him and he refused to leave the, the room when they did it. And the kids said it to his mom and she puts that into an affidavit. A second one is a teacher. He had parent teacher conference and the whole time he was trashing Kim and he finally threatened to kill her and he used the word bury her uh, and she reported it. And then that's two of like dozens. Remember the Rucky case, all, all kinds. So this guy was abusive every which way. Plus, he's got a criminal record from before he met her in another state. So this is a real charming guy. So yes, and I need listeners to understand. I've said this before, but when uh when as a social worker I assess for lethality in a potential like domestic violence victim, when death like that is actually threatened and to go and use those words saying I will bury her, that exponentially exponentially raises the score of the assessment tool for being at high risk of actually being murdered by their their ex-partner or, or whomever right just wanted and to note that in the rookie case it should be noted that one thing that everyone agrees on is that david rucky was in a bar near uh near where they live and he met the the guy the guy did testify in court but when i spoke to him he asked to, to remain anonymous however everything i said uh here it is uh, so the, everyone agrees that this happened because not everyone agrees, but he testified in court to this. The witness told her, referring to Gra Sandra Rossini Rucky, that David, that David Rucky had spoken with him while he was at Beer, Bratz and Bingo in Lakeville, Minnesota. During the conversation, David told him that the Hell's Angels were going to do him a favor by harming Sandra while she was at her cabin. And I believe in when this was testified to in court, the witness followed up by saying that David said the kids will find their mother floating face down in the river. So pretty much the same thing. Am I right? Uh, yeah, that's pretty. Right. Serious. Yeah. It's like we it's like we've got a pattern every which way. So what Kim told me is everything was actually fine in their uh, divorce because she didn't discover the physical abuse until a couple a few years after the divorce was finalized and they had the custody arrangement. And 
Everything got triggered by her going to get a protective order. As soon as that happened, it triggered the custody case with this guy, Tim Wormager. And Wormager was the very first judge on the Rucky case. And he makes the initial decision. And uh, and it's actually pretty interesting because uh, the way he decided it originally, um, it's they basically said everything is fine. Uh, we've both... Uh, we've both had, uh, we both got what we wanted under Wormager, if you can believe that. Um, and so then he, sh- he before then showed up repeatedly on, uh, so here, let me read you Tim Wormager. This is in the Rucky case. The parties were able to settle all issues arising out of the dissolution of the marriage, including child custody and support, spousal maintenance, disposition of real and personal property, and the payments of debts and attorney fees. They were able to agree on all of that. Do you know when that was written? It was, I don't know. When was it written? In 2011, I believe. That, that case, May 12, 2011, that case was open until a few months ago when they finally closed it. So after a judge said everything is settled, we've all agreed to everything, then it was opened up. Uh, that's t- Now, Tim Wormager wasn't a party to that, but Tim Wormager said parties have agreed to all issues. How can it be opened up if parties had agreed to all issues? Something that none of them can explain, or they claim that another judge said that Wormager only came to this conclusion because he was defrauded. Um, even though the evidence was David Rucky saying that he believed he was being defrauded. He provided no evidence besides that. Could not exp- the way he explained that, that judge's decision is he, was, he said, well, all she gave me was the last page to sign. I just signed the last page, so I didn't know what was on it. Uh, and he also suggested that he thought he was getting a paper divorce, which is a term he came up with. Uh, so oh, that's, okay. <laughs> so that's everything with Tim. That's with Tim Wormager in the Rucky case. So in uh, in Kim Sperling's case, she discovered abuse, as I described in other incidents, a few years afterwards. And uh, so um, after she went to get a protective order, the, the custody was opened up and they started arguing a whole bunch of things. She eventually had to move out of the county and she goes on vacation one day. And, and when she comes back, she's served with a notice of an emergency hearing to change custody temporarily. So she goes in and he basically argues that she's crazy and is interfering with her ex that is interfering with his ability to become uh, a good father. And and she makes sure to note of this, her kids were thriving. They're all getting straight A's or, or at least A's and B's and doing fine. Everything was good. And so custody is switched. And then after a little while, a few weeks or maybe a few months, he kicks his daughter, the oldest daughter, out of the house. But she's not even allowed to go back and live with Kim because the court order says she can't live with Kim. So she has to live with one of her friends and, and, their, and her parents for a while. And Kim's able to change custody. And so she gets custody back. And soon after that, her ex challenges it and says, yeah, even though I kicked her out of the house, I should have joint decision making. How about that? So her and her daughter says, we need to run. We're not safe here. And that's the reason they took off to Canada. So she gets to Canada. She's got like a box or a couple of boxes worth of evidence. And so she presents all of this evidence and they let her stay initially as the case unfolds. And what she told me is they kept saying, well, if what you're saying is accurate, then the FBI will help. So you just need to get the FBI to help. And, uh, and she couldn't get the FBI to help and they, in, in Canada or whoever, the federal authorities. They, they, they wouldn't grant her status because they were insistent that whatever is happening here, obviously the federal government would help you in a case like this. And so they wouldn't grant her, um, they wouldn't grant her asylum. However, after a while, they, they offered her permanent uh, nationality or permanent citizenship instead. So I, I don't know. She didn't. She wound up not taking it because by the time everything unfolded, her daughter had turned eighteen, so she'd go back, and and, and there's nothing they could do to her daughter because uh, that's the age you age out, as they say. So she what? then. Mm-hmm. What was on, the this, age of the the daughter when she said, "We're not safe. We need to go." Fourteen or fifteen. Wow. 
Okay, so she comes back to Minnesota and goes to a different county. And so she files for an emergency protective order. And then she even, on top of the protective order, gets emergency custody after she explains to this judge. And I'm sure I don't have the judge's name in front of me, though I should, uh, what happened. So that's in a different county in Minnesota. Uh, oh, and I should, and I mentioned the five there. So she then goes to the kid's school in Lakeville, Minnesota. The cops stop her. Now, normally what cops tell you is, if you're like, look at this bogus order. Why would you follow? Why would you do this? Thing? Hey, that was a judicial order. We're required. Well, it turns out in this case, Lakeville, Minnesota police were not required. So not only did they refuse to honor the order, they called Judge Wormager and advised him to write his own order that superseded the order she was holding, which he did. Oh, my God. Okay. Oh, my God. So um, that's basically Kim Sterling's story, Sperling's story. And hopefully we'll have her on uh, to talk about it in more detail. But we don't need to take a break for a while, right? No, but can I ask you a question? Why, mm -hmm. I mean, was, do you think it would have had a different outcome if she had returned to a different state other than Minnesota? I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. Okay. okay. All right, so I, I, there's a no, so those three women are from um, Dakota County, Minnesota. This next case is Carver County, Minnesota, which is kind of sort of near Dakota County. So if you would, I wrote a somewhat long article, but it'll take me like four to five minutes to read it. How about I read you this article? This is Caroline Rice and her daughter, Annalise. Okay? Go for it, yeah, let's hear. File, and this was written in May, on May 5, 2017. Filed in March 2017, a new federal civil rights lawsuit in Minnesota hopes to strike a dagger in the heart of corruption in family courts. Annalise Rice, 19, currently a freshman at the University of North Dakota, recently filed that lawsuit against her father, Brent Rice, a financial advisor at Merrill Lynch, as well as Hennepin and Carver Counties a judge and several, and several court professionals and social workers. All were involved in her family court case that she argues deprived her of her civil rights. All in an exclusive interview with this CDN reporter, Annalise Rice described a nightmarish childhood in which she was taken away from her mother without explanation and forced to live with a father who she alleges, while mostly absent, she alleges he was abusive when he was present. Rice ran away multiple times, including one incident during which she spent approximately one month on the run with her mother. Rice ran, or she was repeatedly forced to live in foster care when not living with her father. Rice argues in her lawsuit that the family court repeatedly violated her due process rights and used pseudoscience to support forcing her to live with her abusive father while being kept away from her mother. In part, the lawsuit states, by co this is a quote from the lawsuit now, by coercing and financially harassing plaintiff's mother into abandoning her legal efforts to protect Anne Lees through the courts, by knowingly allowing the introduction of false testimony, by allowing into evidence and or the court's consideration the bogus, disreputable, and pro-child abuser parental alienation syndrome theory concocted by the discredited misogynist Richard Gardner, by failing to disclose to the court the unethical and prejudicial relationship between defendant Brent Rice and defendants by prohibiting Anne Lee's Rice or any older siblings from testifying on her own behalf in order to obtain protections from the abuse, by falsifying Child Protective Services reports on plaintiff's abuse and other acts, end quote. So the next section of this article is entitled Richard Gardner and Parental Alienation Syndrome. Parental Alienation Syndrome, which incidentally is what Sam was accused of, allegedly triggered by Annalise Rice by the behavior of her mother, Caroline Rice, and Richard Gardner himself are extremely controversial in the precincts of family law. As noted in the language of the current suit, Gardner has made a series of pro-pedophile and misogynistic statements that tend to undercut his theory. And now I'm going to quote from those. There's a bit of pedophilia in every one of us, Gardner once wrote, observing that, quote, pedophilia has been considered the norm by the vast majority of individuals in the history of the world. 
Parental alienation syndrome, and or end quote after world. Parental alienation syndrome theory claims that parents, almost exclusively women, put abuse allegations into the heads of their children to alienate them from their father. The theory has largely been dismissed by all courts, law enforcement personnel, and psychologists, save for those working in family courts. The District Attorneys Association of the State of New York instructed that, quote, prosecutors should diligently question any case law or article that is cited as supporting past theory, end quote. Next section is entitled, Annalise Rice Tells Her Tale. Since I, quote, since I could remember my dad beat my mom up, end quote, Annalise Rice said. She stated that because of repeated domestic abuse at the hands of her father, when she was in second or third grade, her mother got a restraining order against Brent Rice, and Annalise began living with her. About a year later, a woman Annalise didn't know, since identified as Susan Olson, an attorney and the guardian at litem in the case, picked, picked her up, taking her to her father's house. She then began living with her father with no explanation for why she could no longer see her mother. Olson, in, in parentheses, Olson is also named as a defendant in the current case, in parentheses. What Ann Lees didn't know at the time was that the court, including Olson, had accused her mother of parental alienation syndrome and awarded Brent Rice sole custody of Ann Lees as a result. And that's exactly what happened in the Rocky case. A guardian, that, and the, now this is a quote from the uh, from the lawsuit. A guardian at litem report written by defendant Jean Pat Peterson recommended the split custody that the court later adopted on August eighth, August eighteenth, two thousand five. No testimony was received into the record as to why the children were separated, and no findings were made that justified the separation. End quote. The law states explaining what what was happening in court. No one explained to Ann Lease Rice, however. Caroline Rice said that Olson, along with Jean P P Peterson, were two of several guardian at litem appointed to the case. One day after Ann Lees had spent several months living with her father, Olson called her at home and told her she was no longer going to see her mother before abruptly hanging up the phone with no further explanation. Quote, I threw the phone against the wall, end quote, Rice said of learning the news. Olson did not respond to a message left at her law office. Rice, Annalise Rice, said her father was mostly an absentee dad and, when she, and she was raised by a nanny. Yet when he was around, she says he was physically abusive. During one physical altercation, she, she was thrown against the refrigerator. During another, her father broke her arm. Brent Rice denied either of these incidents happened. However, Annalise Rice said the police were called on one occasion, and the police officer involved spent the entire time grilling her older sister, suggesting the physical confrontation was her sister's fault. Uh, here's a quote. Go ahead and tell the police no one will believe you, end quote. Annalise said she remembered her father saying repeatedly. After one of these beatings, which took place around the time she was in fifth grade, Rice ran away from her father's home walking several miles alone and at night to her grandparents' house. Her grandparents, the parents of Caroline Rice, promptly and successfully filed for another restraining order against Brent Rice. As a result, Ann Lease was ordered to live with them. After about a month of living with her grandparents, Rice was again placed into a series of foster homes without explanation and eventually found herself back in a courtroom where she was told she'd be living with her father. They, referring to the, or here's a quote, they, referring to the court, told me if I ran again, I'd go to juvie, referring to juvenile hall, Annalise said, describing the threats used to force her to live with her father during this period. Annalise Rice said she was taken to the hospital because she had become suicidal. Stated in, the, now I'm quoting from the, from the lawsuit again, plaintiff Annalise Rice is hospitalized on June 10, 2008, for suicidal ideation due to the stress defendant Brent Rice and other defendants have placed on her by interfering with the mother-child relationship. Reports state, the, and, and this is quoting from a report in the lawsuit, the patient states that she lives with her father, but she is scared of him and doesn't feel safe at home. End quote. Anne Lise Rice was convinced by her older sister to go back home while she was still in the, her hospital bed, now I'm quoting from Ann Lees, she told me we'd do it together, she said, end quote, after together. Ann Lees Rice said that after her arm was broken, she was taken by her stepmother 
uh, Brent Rice had since remarried, to the hospital where her stepmother said the broken arm was due to horseplay that got out of control. Though she was in the presence of her stepmother the entire time, Rice said she did tell one doctor that the broken arm was due to her father hitting her. That, however, was not reported. After the incident, Rice said she ran away again and got hold of a family friend who in turn contacted her mother. The two of them went on the run, finally ending up in Canada. After a month on the run, however, they crossed back into Michigan and were promptly detained. Her mother subsequently became the first person in Minnesota history tried for parental deprivation. She was convicted and sentenced to approximately two months in prison, but her conviction was overturned. Here's how the reversal was covered. This week, Minnesota State Court of Appeals sent a strong message of support to abused children trapped in the system when it overturned Caroline Rice's conviction on three counts of deprivation of parental rights. In the, case, in the case of State versus Rice, the appellate court decided that the reason why Caroline's conviction was were illegitimate was that Judge Richard Perkins and the state's prosecutor had engaged in various forms of misconduct during the trial that violated Caroline Caroline's civil rights and deprivated her of a fair hearing. End quote. Annalise Rice said she testified, but the judge being Richard Perkins, interrupted her nearly 50 times as she did so, also interrupting her sister 90 times during the course of her testimony. An email to Bo Berenson, public affairs officer for the Minnesota courts, for an explanation of Judge Perkins' behavior was left unreturned. Perkins retired from the bench in 2015 and was never formally reprimanded for his behavior in this case. Now, next subset, Brent Rice Speaks. CDN that's the place I wrote it for, interviewed Brent Rice, who denied all allegations in the case, said Rice, what I've been put through over the last 20 years, I could write a book. He suggested any difficulties in the divorce were caused by an unspecified mental illness of his ex-wife, Caroline Rice and Sandra Grazzini Rucky. The second person to be convicted of parental deprivation in Minnesota was Sandra Grazzini Rucky, a case that has been covered extensively by CDN. Both cases share a number of similarities. Not only did the children run away in both cases after their allegations were ignored, but both Grazzini, Rucky, and Rice were accused of parental alienation syndrome. This CDN's reporter's investigation also found judicial misconduct in the Grazzini, Rucky case, during which the judge, Karen Aspog, disallowed, mo it's not all, most of the evidence of parental, paternal abuse. You read, I, I read you what was allowed in the record. Caroline Rice said she was in the courtroom when Grazzini Rucky's daughter, Samantha Rucky, who also ran away after the allegations of abuse, was allowed to testify by Skype with her father present just outside of the courtroom, or outside of the room where she was located, meaning Samantha when she was testifying. Rice called this unprecedented. And then the last subsection, the nightmare concludes. After Annalise Rice was picked up in Michigan, she was then back once again to her. She was sent back to once again to her father. But now that she was older, she said she spent most of her time at the homes of friends with the remaining time spent in her father's custody, endeavor, endeavoring to do anything she could to avoid any contact with him. By her sophomore year, Rice said her father backed off and was less violent and controlling. Behind the scenes, however, this was because her mother had filed an appeal with a new attorney. The result of that appeal was that the original decision was overturned. Uh, and now I'm quoting from the appeal. In September 2013, the Minnesota Appellate Court reversed Carver County uh, Court decision against plaintiff's mother. According to the Minnesota Law Journal, quote, the reversal for, for prejudicial Judicial conduct is unusual, said Hennepin County Judge Kevin Burke. The fact that I have been a judge almost 30 years and can remember one other case, it doesn't happen very often. You, sir, are lying, Judge Burke. It happens plenty, Burke said. Uh, after the decision was overturned, the case was sent back to the trial and the custody arrangement stayed in place. But Annalise Rice said she began seeing her mother regularly, even though there was a court order forbidding it. No one ever did anything. 
about the violation of the restraining order, she said. When she turned 18, Annalise moved out of her father's house and she said she no longer has a relationship with him. I charge Brent Rice tonight. By the way, he told me they have a great relationship, even though I talked to him just as the lawsuit hit. So she was suing him for millions, but they have a great relationship. Her current lawsuit, which, by the way, has since been dismissed, alleging deprivation of civil rights is for $240 million total. And she's asking for $15 million from her father. Rice said she's been contacted by other victims from all over the country since that filing and hopes to turn her lawsuit into a class action suit, which didn't happen. Taking on corruption in family courts nationwide. Um, and that's the end of the article. Doesn't that sound a little bit like the Sperling case? Doesn't that sound a lot like the Rocky case? Uh, now we got Jessica Harker that has four cases. Um, it's quite a lot of, uh, of cases we've found so far. We got, we yeah. got some time? We've, we've still got some time, uh, though, right? Oh, we have time, and you're welcome to stay after the break. I mean, we just it's just going to be like three or four minutes of station promotions. No, 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 and, got... and you can hang up like 10 minutes into the next hour or whatever. So okay. if you go, go ahead. All right. No, I think we wanted it for an hour. Uh, there's one other case out of Carver County that I wanted to mention that, that did receive a lot of attention. However, most of the things that that were covered about it have since been removed from the uh, from the case uh, or from the case from the uh, from the internet. But her name is Leah Danowitz, uh, and uh, her case happened in Carver County as well many years ago. In fact, for a while, that was considered the most notorious custody case in the history of Minnesota until the Rucky case. Uh, and she alleged not only physical abuse but sexual abuse, and. Um, and so, in any case, uh, the only thing that I can find is a uh, is like a uh, like a petition online to help with her case. But uh, but but and 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 I should also mention she was accused of parental alienation syndrome, parental alienation. If I didn't mention that before, so that happened in the Rice case, which was Carver County. That happened in Rocky, which is Dakota County. It also happened with Leah Danowitz, which is Carver County. Uh, Spurley, Kim, what she told me is she felt like her case was so early that they hadn't even figured out to call it parental alienation. She believes that's why it wasn't. So she would just be given like normal terms, like just crazy. Um, and so in any case, um, what was I going to say? So, uh, I, there's one other one that I wanted to cover. Um, and that is, I think her last name is Sperling, or not per, Sperling, Sterling. And this woman, yes, yeah, so here it is. Um, so this woman has 24 pages of uh, CPS reports. And uh, this, against her ex, 24 pages. And she was the one accused of, you want to guess what she was accused of? Uh, parental alienation syndrome? Yes. On the weekend of March, May 24, 2014, mother had a supervised visit with her daughter at Perspectives, which is the supervisory place. Mother has been accused of parental alienation in the past and is court ordered to have only supervised visits with, with the daughter. They watched the movie Walking with Dinosaurs. The daughter told her that she had to go to the bathroom and she did not have any underwear on. The daughter ran under the sink in the bathroom, acted very scared and coward. Daughter said, quote, I don't want you to hurt me like daddy does. Mother asked daughter what she meant by that, and daughter said, like daddy did when he hurt my arm when I got in trouble. Daughter did not have any visible injuries during visits. Mother then told her daughter that she would never hurt her, and it goes on. And there's 20, not necessarily 24 rep reports, but 24 pages of these. 24, daughter's mother visits her at visitation. Daughter told her mother during the visit 523 20, 2014 that father grabs her by the arm when she's in trouble and hurts her. Um, sounds like abuse. Am I right? 
Um, definitely. Did Let me just read read from an appeals court how they characterize all of these abuse allegations. Let's go ahead and, and see what the courts say. Okay, hold on. Domestic abuse. This is the section. The trial court considered appellant's accusation, that's Lene Sterling, that the respondent, her ex, was abusive to the minor child as is demonstrated by the trial court's findings. After considering all the evidence presented by appellant respondent, the child protection worker, the custody evaluator, Gary Guptill, and the guardian at litem, the trial court found that respondent was not credible and has questionable ability to relay events accurately. By the way, um, these CPS reports, are they taking the testimony of the mother or the daughter? Let me read the CPS report again. Uh, daughter's mother visits her at visitation center. Daughter told her mother during visit that father grabs her by the arm when she's in trouble and hurts her. W what does it matter what, how the mother perceives these things? The daughter is the one saying it. How come they're, they're putting it off on the mother? Do you see that? That's called corruption, folks. So yeah. um, we, we've identified, I think, six cases just now. And there are many more all throughout. Uh, this, by the way, happened in Hennepin County, which is where Minneapolis is. So we've got several counties, Carver, Hennepin, Dakota, that, that I've just talked about so far. Women are coming forward all the time. If you had this happen to you in Minnesota, reach out to me, something like this, where your ex is the abusive one, you go for help, and they spin it around on you. That's a tactic. It's happening. I don't know how many women I want to find out. So if this has been happening to you, let me know. Um, I... Uh, I, I've talked for a while, so I think it's time for you to speak for a little while because it's your show. No, that's okay. No, I'm just I'm just taking notes, and uh, next hour I'm gonna just expand on some of the things you're saying. Um, that's all, and so um, additional information. Wait, that I, I want to I want to point out one other thing. In the Rocky case, there are 25 pages of CPS reports, including the CPS report where his son Nico, that's David. Mm hmm sticks a gun to his son's head when his son is eight years old, Nico. And Nico is the one who told CPS this happened. Now, Nico tells people to never see his father be violent. Nico teamed up with his father. But remember, she's got 24, they got 25. But I, I did want to point out how Nico teamed up with his father. And also, the reason he did that, according to other notes, is... Right at, he started doing that right after his father bought him a car. His father bought him off. Nico sided with his monster of a father, violent man who destroys everything that gets in his way because he was bribed. Just in case you're a woman m m early to mid-20s and you, and you find, find out he's dating you or someone you know, that's how he's going to treat you. Keep that in mind. Whoever that guy marries, he's going to treat exactly like his father treated Sandra Grazini Rucky. So if anybody finds out he's dating a woman, you need to tell her to run as fast as possible. Um, but, okay, you got something you wanted to say? No, I was just going to say that I think also that even though he was bribed, I'm sure, given his father's uh, history, from what I know, he likely said, uh, see, when you're good to me, this is what you get. When you don't, you're going to get this, this, and this. I'm going to take everything away from you just like I did your goddamn mother. I bet right. you he's I'm he's sure, he's playing sure. both sides of the coin. Like, look, yeah, here are the perks, that. and here are the here are the negative consequences. And so, uh, that yeah, sounds like he made a devil's bargain. Mm -hmm. Sounds like he made it. Yeah, that's great. Well, so you know what? When people like Nico make a devil's bargain, that means you signed a deal with the devil. So if you get involved with Nico, he's already signed a deal with the devil. You just explain right. it to me. You just said it right there. So yeah, regardless of how he got entangled. If you get caught up with that guy right now, he's entangled with the devil because you just said he made a devil's bargain. Um, so in any case, he's, uh, by the way, he went out to Hollywood, Nico, that is, thought he'd, he'd turn his life story into a movie. And he's now back working at either like BW3, which I guess is working now, or maybe one of the bookstores. So, um, and uh, that's the last time I checked on Nico. Uh, and uh, one other thing, you should, all the daughters look exactly like their mother. Um, but please, you wanted to give a little uh, 
summary or analysis of what you heard? Well, uh, I'm the fact that he tried to go out to Hollywood and make a life story, it sounds, again, like something he was probably goaded to do to negate the fact that all of the work that was done on that uh, ABC, um, six, what was it, 60, no, 66? 2020. 2020. 2020. Because if he's an adult now and he's telling his life story, then who can deny that? Um, and so it's going to be Except he's not more. His, right. Right. But it's going to be more smear. Was. Yeah. It, but he's going to be, it's going to be more smear tactic because it's going to be a story that's presented well, from the perception of what he's told to tell the filmmakers or the story writers or whatever, because he has obviously made this deal with the devil. Right. Do what well, I say, go told, sell your story, and negate everything that's happened on 2020. Right. Well, he told CPS that his father stuck a gun to his head. So oh, if, that's yeah. not, if that's not in the eventual movie or book, well, then you know <laughs> that he's not actually telling the truth. All right? Because that's kind of an important situation to have happen to you. And it's hard to yeah. imagine you'd make that up. And by the way, when he told CPS that, his mother wasn't in the room unless they broke all protocols. And that's not the only thing that was told to CPS. CPS re received that 10-minute audio recording that I played on your show the first time where Samantha describes all sorts of abuse. Oh, yeah. Uh, so that's – but look, as I said, this thing – this is so much bigger than the Rucky case. We, we may have tens of thousands of women – just in the state of Minnesota going through what I just described from five or six women. That's wow. how serious the problem is just in the state of Minnesota. That's what we're dealing with right now. That's what you had me on the show. I don't know how much more time we got. Oh, we got a few minutes. Okay. Um, does anyone in the chat room maybe have a question or an interesting thought you wanted to share? Um, I think everybody, I mean, they're commenting about, um, absolute, uh, Captain Fred made a comment about absolute, um, allegiance to the law or whatever, and mm -hmm. how it's coming more and more apparent that, um, it's malicious obedience of law. Um, that was an interesting phrase, but at any rate, that's, that's our cue. Okay. Thank you so much for your, um, presence today and reading your story and showing us these trends so that we can look out for each other and hopefully make change happen. All right. I'll talk to you later. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye-bye.